welcome. Thanks for joining us. May the Holy Spirit work in your life as you hear this message. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid. The calf and the lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze. Their young shall lie down together. And the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hand over the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That was from the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 6 through 9. And it is one of my go-to passages in the Bible. If I ever need a sermon or some reading for meditation or if I need a, a pick-me-up when my cynicism gets the best of me, I turn to God's vision of a holy mountain. And when I turn to it, I remember how each species makes room for all the other creatures. The lion learns to eat straw, and the cow and the bear graze together. And as the baby plays, the serpent chooses not to strike. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. I love this vision because it actually breaks into a much larger one. A vision of a shoot and a branch growing out of the stump of Jesse, that is King David's father. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. So, embedded in this vision of Messiah, our Lord and Savior, our rescuer from sin and death, coming into the world, embedded into his arrival is a vision of peace on earth. A peace in which we all finally Make room for one another, striving to live alongside each other in peace. I love this vision of humanity, God's creation finally achieving a state of oneness. And it's a vision that, that keeps me going. Because the hard news is, we still have a ways to go. Conflict, struggle, fights, suffering persists throughout the Bible, well past the, the book of Isaiah. And throughout human history, this is the case. And, and even the history of the church, even the history of Methodism. Conflicts and struggles and fights and suffering persist within our friendships and our families, our workplaces and communities. And if perhaps we look into ourselves, we might find that conflict and struggle exists within our own soul. How often do we think negatively of ourselves, dwell on our failures, our our faults? How often do we break our own hearts? And how often do we then take our internal struggles and our frustrations and our anger at existence and then inflict it on others? In how many ways 
do we immerse ourselves in misery? And yet, throughout the Bible, from the Old Testament all the way through Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, which we'll read in a minute, it seems clear to me at least that God wants something far grander than all of this fragmentation and fury. Isaiah and Paul both teach that God wants oneness for us all. So let us strive to form one body, living in faith, treating one another with patience and gentleness and humility. Now, time is flying by faster than I can comprehend. We now come to the third of our five readings from Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. And, and this time, the apostle turns from building the case that Jews and Gentiles in Ephesus become a new humanity through the sacrifice of Christ Jesus. Paul turns from this theological discourse to the personal qualities that all believers should exhibit as they continue in their life together. So let's open, let's, let's open our Bibles or our apps and turn to Paul's epistle to the Ephesians chapter 4, first verse. And as we open to it, let's remember that Paul writes the Ephesians all the way from Rome, over 800 miles away. And, and Paul is a prisoner, a prisoner of the Roman Empire. And also remember that at this point, all churches in Christ exist within a varied and diverse religious environment. Temples devoted to pantheons of deities abound. And so in an ecosystem so, so diverse, so filled with temptations, and so rife with politics and power plays, how might a nascent church survive and grow? How shall believers live together? Let's read Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you, to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God, the Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Amen. Now when we began reading Ephesians, I pointed out that it is only six chapters long, and so you could read through the whole thing, I guess, in about a half an hour. But, but as you read through it, I hope that we can all see that, that Paul takes great pains to, to unify people of vastly different backgrounds. From the Jewish diaspora throughout the Middle East and into Europe, to Gentile worshipers of Greek and Roman deities, people who previously worshipped the emperor of Rome. Through faith in Jesus Christ, by trusting that his sacrifice atones for all sin, people from all walks of life, all social and economic stations, become citizens of God's kingdom here on earth. That's some good news right there. Okay, but what now, Pastor? 
How do we live now? What do we do? How do we do things? Do we go back to the way things have always been done? Do we leave here celebrating our worship and our togetherness and then go off to lunch and forget it all? Yay, we've been saved. Let's go back to work. Let's get angry at our bosses and our coworkers, and let's come home and let's yell at our spouses and kids and kick the dog. Let's do that. Let's, let's keep taking advantage of those who are less well-off than us. Let's write laws and policies that benefit our little in-group and rain down suffering on everybody else. Let's do that. Let's disparage and dehumanize everyone who looks or lives a little bit differently than we do. And when we come to power, let's shut out our political opponents entirely. Let's force our will upon them. After all, if we are citizens of God's kingdom, then this is our kingdom too, isn't it? Well, if we have any reverence for the Bible, if we have any reverence for Paul, for Christ, for the prophets, the answer is a resounding no. We do not go back to our old ways. The old way entails the wolf devouring the lamb. The lion killing the cow, the serpent biting the child, and the grown-up striking the serpent down. We have played that game since forever. So no. Instead, Paul calls the Ephesians and us, by the way, to live a life worthy of the calling to which we have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love and making every effort, every effort, to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In these few verses, Paul describes the qualities that people of faith should exhibit in their day-to-day -day lives with one another and with everyone in our, little, in, in our group outside. Why? Well, how else to preach the gospel to people who know it not? If we can all just continue with this cycle of misery and agony and anger, well, why bother? I mean, where's the good news in hurting and destroying on God's holy mountain? It seems to me that repentance, that is the Greek word being metanoia, that is changing our minds and our lives for the better, repentance entails changing our behavior, our habits, and how we relate with others. Over the span of 2,000 years, the Christian faith has grown into a global phenomenon in large part out of the transformation of billions of individual souls, hearts and minds, all over the world. It grew out of generations of people bearing with one another in love, treating each other with patience, embracing positions of leadership and high esteem with humility, and teaching others to do likewise. A few years back, while I was slogging my way through the ordination process, my group of fellow candidates and I traveled to Leewood, Kansas to visit the Church of the Resurrection. It is, I think, one of the largest United Methodist Church in the United States, if not the largest, and now they actually practice ministry in five locations around Kansas City. And 
Oh, I should, I should tell you that, that the stained glass window that they have is as long as this entire wall right here. I mean, it is, it is immense. It's fantastic. And, and so every year, the Church of the Resurrection hosts a workshop where guests learn a little bit about how they do ministry financial policies, technology and worship, hospitality, evangelism, the whole thing. And so, even though they're, as a, as a large, very, very successful church, they live into the notion that they are blessed to be a blessing. I mean, not only do they use their own resources to practice ministry in their area, they also share very abundantly and generously the resources that they have to all, the, all who come. And, and that attitude of generous helpfulness and service runs all the way from the highest leadership to the volunteers who stand in the hallways greeting guests and helping them get where they need to go. And, and I have to say that, that it really buoys me, lifts me up, right, to, to hear someone, especially someone stronger than myself, ask, how can I help you? How can I help? And what a relief it is to learn from, from a patient teacher, someone who's been there, who's done that, who's made all the mistakes anyone can make, and guides someone else through their own process of learning and doing and growing. And what a blessing it is to have people in our lives who, who move through life with us, gently and patiently bearing us up in love when we fall down or when we fail. It is such a blessing. And Paul asks us to do likewise. Just as God's creatures in Isaiah alter their own lives to live side by side with each other in peace, so we can alter the way we live the way we communicate, the way we behave, to foster peace among one another within ourselves and in the world outside. Now, the reality of it is conflict of all sorts will erupt from time to time. We all disagree. We all hurt each other's feelings, and we will compete for this, that, and the other thing. But in the midst of all that mess, what if we could pause and take a step back and view our opponents as God's children? Human beings created and loved by God. Potential followers of the way of Christ. There is one body and one spirit just as we were called to the one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. What if we saw one another and treated one another as part of that one body, created by God, the Father of all, saved from sin and death from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, what if all 12 million United Methodists and 2 billion followers of Christ moved through the world as lovingly and selflessly and self-givingly as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? If we did that, might our world not resemble in some small way God's vision of a holy mountain? given to us by Isaiah. Let's strive together to do that. Amen. And let us pray. I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this Everyone will know that you are my disciples 
if you have love for one another. Loving and gracious God, your Son, our Savior, our Teacher, our Healer, and our Friend, bids us that we love one another. To love in a biblical sense is to live with the disciplined will to seek the well-being of others. To put the, the well-being of others before ourselves. And to do everything so far as we can, so far as it depends on us, to maintain a spirit of peace with one another. And God, your Son, also teaches us to go out into the world and make disciples of all nations. So God, we pray that your Holy Spirit will flow through us today, light a fire within our hearts, and encourage us to go out with boldness and courage and, and steadfast patience and love to bring your love to the world so filled with darkness and anger and chaos, to bring just a little bit of your divine light into this crazy, disordered, and violent world. God, give us peace in our hearts. Where there is turmoil within, God, we pray that we will remember the words of your Son. Peace, be still. And God, may your Holy Spirit unite us all, bond us all together in love, that we may carry forth our ministries in this church and continue to bless the world. God, we thank you for your son Jesus who came into this world and who healed us and who fed us, who rescued us and welcomed us, who raised us from our death and in his sacrifice opened the gates to a new and amazing and eternal life. And so God, in gratitude for this ultimate gift, we now offer you the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share our video. Let's send God's love all over the world. If you find yourself in Jensen Beach, Florida, please join us for worship. Our services are at 9, 15, and 11. And if you'd like to find out more, please visit www.trinityjb.org. See you next time. Blessings.